Mr. Ryan Anderson. How are you doing today, sir? I'm good, brother. How you been? Ryan, I'm doing all right. I'm doing all right. Um, I kind of want to know this first. Uh, is there one thing that you didn't know existed until far too late in life that you really had no excuse for not knowing of his existence? Ooh, that's a good one. And there is something and I'm missing what it was. It was pretty recent. Oh boy. And I felt like, you know, you just get that feeling that you're an idiot. Like, how did I not know that? I'll have to rethink because I've got one for you. Let me get the juices flowing and I'll come back to it. That's right. We can definitely come back to it. I'll give you mine real quick. Uh, for me, kettle corn. Didn't know it was a thing until I was a full-on adult. And uh, no idea. That's maybe my parents' fault, probably. Um, but uh, just had no idea that you could put sugar on popcorn. That's slightly terrifying. So you never had like Cracker Jacks as a kid? That's kind of like, that's more carnal. Well, see, I didn't know that those were in the same family. Like I understood what Cracker Jacks was, but I didn't know kettle corn was its own like pure thing. If you want to stick to the topic of food, I didn't know. I knew they existed, but I never tried one until about last year. Uncrustables. Oh. I know it's just peanut butter and jelly, but it's the best peanut butter and jelly you'll ever have in your life. And it's just a, all the fake filler stuff that's terrible for you. All that goodness. But you never had one. I'll say that. That's one thing that I regret that I never tried until recently and also regret trying. As interesting and possibly concerning as both of our answers might be, um, moving over to the world of insurance, I, I want to talk about sort of you know where you exist in the industry and your sort of experience in it, and and I guess what hasn't really caught its caught its way on your radar maybe sooner than it should have. Like, what's something that you came a little late to the party when it came to the business? What's something that you wish you maybe learned learned sooner? Um, just anything that you maybe regret. You know, where I'm at now is second year here in sales. And I think, um, cause I've kind of bounced around. I started in small commercial personal lines and then went kind of the back into things. And honestly, just getting straight large commercial from the beginning sales, starting out early. I see a lot of these younger kids that are starting at 21, 22. They don't have the background knowledge, which is, neat but they've got all this time to build a nice book and i would i'd say you know it's a great business to get into early sales go after the big stuff that would be something that i forget you know sticking to the small stuff you do learn a lot in the middle you know learning that stuff there's things that you just have to learn in the biz but you can learn it on the big stuff too well i'm glad you've laid out a giant launching pad for the rest of this conversation because i have plenty <laughs> of questions for that um, I guess I will say one, I don't know if we're, I don't know if you want to talk about this or not, but w one thing that I did find interesting about sort of your journey and, and maybe where you're at now is you did walk away from the industry for a few years, which is something that typically many people don't do, especially in, in your area. Like, how was that? Like, explain getting out, like start, like you said, where you started maybe and, and what that was like and then trying to get back in. Um, well, I've been in it since I could hold a job, basically. Um, and my family's been in it for since I was a kid, my stepdad started to scratch all state, sold that started a nationwide book. And that's kind of where I got into it about 21. So, so getting out of it, it wasn't, it really, I mean, it was a choice, but when all the madness hit, I was out, I got out in 2020, it was kind of a choice. The kids were going to be home and they were going to be home 24 seven because schools were closed and it was a discussion with me and my wife, who's going to stay and who's going to work. And at the time she was the breadwinner. So it was a financial obligation decision, right? I stayed in contact with a lot of people, but I kind of went off the radar. I think when you get out of insurance, you think, oh, I'll never be back. I'll, I'm going to find something new. I'm going to write a book. I'm going to do this. But uh, anyone knows that when you're in insurance, it's tough to get out. So I was out two years. Definitely know that I'm not the best stay at home father. <laughs> it's not my, I'm good, but I'm not that good. I'm definitely what I call a grinder. So it wasn't hard after two years of not working to get back in. Um, it was pretty easy at that point. I love the time with the kids, but man, I'm a worker. That's just how I do. So, yeah, well, I find it interesting that you say, you know, one of your biggest 
things of which, of, of what you wish you would have known is, you know, going after that big stuff right away. And yeah. is, uh, so what was that journey back in? And, and when did you was, I mean, I'm assuming there was maybe a mild level of intimidation, but when did you say to yourself, ah, this is just like anything else? Or like, I'm assuming there was a moment where you said, oh, okay, I understand what this is. I mean, you're always kind of intimidated, right? But it's a time thing. You, you learn being in this industry, sometimes the small stuff takes way more time than the big stuff. It's just that, and, and it's all insurance, right? So as long as you kind of stick to what you know, your niche, your vertical, whatever they want to call it, and you know enough to be dangerous, you just start scaling up because time is pretty precious in this industry and you can get sucked into your emails quick. Most of the time, the larger stuff takes less time <laughs> and they're more, I would say those, the larger clients are more savvy, right? They understand the business and they're, they're more um, consultative with you. You know, you're not just in the weeds talking 1 million, 2 million liability and nonsense. You're, you're talking, you're trying to help the business out, right? You're having high level conversations and those conversations, they're willing to set some time to the side for you. Whereas kind of the smaller stuff is more transactional, you know, Hey, you didn't reply to my email two hours ago. And that stuff becomes a drain. So if you can grow your book, but shrink your clients, you can provide them a lot more focused attention and, and provide a lot more value. So I think in the end, it's better to just go after larger stuff. And there's a whole special, you know, especially technology. Now you can really crank out the small business stuff if you're really set up right to do it, but it's, it's, it's a grind if you're, still on paper files or still, you know, doing ENS filing for this little stuff. And I'm not knocking on it because I love small business. It's where I learned everything. Yeah. Well, I mean, the, the one thing that I'd be curious to know is, is how long did it take you to get there from when you got back into it? Like when you got your feet wet again, you, uh, is this something that was encouraged from the new, new landing spot in the business? Yeah. Um, is this something that you sort of slowly figured out on your own? Yeah. So my two years prior to leaving, I was in marketing, not your marketing, insurance marketing. Our office was built on senior living. So I was responsible for marketing our large senior living accounts. That got me really used to large, seeing big numbers, which coming from a small business, you walk in here and see a million dollar premium and you about have a stroke. But then when that becomes normal and you get used to marketing it and, and that's just the regular, it just seems regular, right? So getting back, when I came back, it was to grow the large commercial side of things, which we call in this office, non-senior living. And so, you know, you come back as a producer and you've got revenue thresholds, right? So you can't do anything below X or you don't get paid. I still do a lot of things that may not get paid <laughs> because uh, I just like help so I can get distracted. And I'm, man, curious is, a, you know, curious as a cat. So if it's a neat, funky business, it, if it gets piques my curiosity, I'm on it just because I like to figure that out. I look at, it's you, like I said, the verticals earlier, my vertical being commercial real estate and hospitality, large property, but I can dart off on a tangent to help somebody that's doing some funky widget making and whatnot real quick, because it's just fun to learn about it. So the, the word, I guess, revenue threshold would be something that might be slightly uncommon for you know, maybe I would say a lot of most main street agencies is that have you have you found that to be something that could possibly be explored a little bit more for it to say just to put a little hard number to something, even if it's might might be smaller than what you would expect, just having even any sort of number at the floor there. How, how much of a worthwhile benchmark is that for you to sort of shoot for what you're what you're trying to bring in the door? It narrows your focus, right? So you kind of provide structure and strategy to what you're going after. It took a while when I first got over here to talk revenue, not premium. Everyone, you know, it's, and then once you start talking revenue, you never talk premium. It's just how it is. And yeah, coming from the small side, it was all premium, 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 premium. You know, I was nationwide. That was nationwide before it went broker side. It was captive. But getting that revenue threshold, say it's five grand, right? Average things out. Let's say you get 10%. So anything below 50, you're, Kind of like, eh. especially now with the market, how it is, these increases, or if you're in a place like Florida, 
you know, it's probably dang near 50 grand to insure your house. Not really, but it's in those markets where the property skyrockets, you can hit 50 grand real quick. And then when you're, when you start thinking that, oh, I have to hit this number, things just start opening up. And then you realize that even something that's at your revenue threshold that somebody would look at and go, wait, 5,000 revenue. It's not even that big. And it's the same problems, the same things that you work through. Just going back to that, it's it's still insurance and it's still risk management. You're still talking with these people, but it's revenue, not not premiums, man. <laughs> I might be going a little too far in the weeds in this, but I'm a little curious to, to know how far exactly you guys take it. When you talk revenue thresholds, is there any calculations to like the different types of accounts or industries that might take more or less time to, to write? And like the, the just the overall process to the ultimate profitability of it is that is that is that being factored in at all or is it just no we're gonna we're pretty we feel pretty confident if we just have this 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 number that we'll be okay. Um, we focus heavily on verticals, right? So we have a real estate vertical, a construction vertical, and then once you get the system, or like I said earlier, senior living. Once you have a process built around that type of business, it gets pretty streamlined, right? It is focusing on a vertical and saying that you can't just be going and writing these random widget manufacturers, but we, you know, you have a manufacturing vertical. This is a process we follow. Um, these are the carriers we work with. Ideally, you know, you want to keep it with a carrier that can direct bill and kind of help even on the back end with services. But when you get to the ENS side, that is that back end work. But if you've got a good process set up and you are focused on a specific type of business, you can get it pretty streamlined. And with the larger agencies, right, you have a lot of resources, sometimes too much. So you have to really know which resources to utilize and when. So it can be an overwhelm when you're sitting there, we can do this, we can do that. But but this place does a good job of letting you know the resources, when to utilize them. And that's, it's, it is pretty key. Like you said, you can waste your time on stuff you have to know nothing about. And then all of a sudden it's a big count, but you're relearning insurance practically trying to write it and it's just this whole process and you're not doing the client any justice if you're trying to figure it out for them just trying to save them a buck when really you know trying to save a buck nowadays is, is hard to do it used to be i have this market and this is my underwriter he's great i can you know what they didn't go there i'm gonna hit it the carriers have dialed in their appetite so much that even a good story you know we call it you know top of stack submission you got to get all the information they need and more and tell a great story. And even then they're going, well, it doesn't check this box. So see you later. And and that's getting kind of rough. Um, that could put us on a whole new tangent about underwriting and box checking and kind of the old school people getting out and just the new ones coming in and checking a box where you used to have those people that had some autonomy and got to get creative. You know, I'm young, but I've been in it long enough to know that, Things change and they're changing. I, I think I will have to know at some point before we're done. Talk. I would like to know your best checkbox sort of technique and what what is what is your sort of secret weapon. But before we get to that, um, I, I do want to kind of go back to that. I can just hear the well, you know, Ryan, this sounds great and all, but how do you keep these larger clients? Like, where are they coming from? Like, because I know they're not just falling out of the sky in my neighborhood. Um, wh I mean, what's like, where are you going to get these guys? Like, what's the secret to get into this mix and start building sort of that flow? Yeah, they, these aren't the ones that are inbound calling from your non-inbound marketing campaign that you don't have. <laughs> you know, if you're sitting there picking up the phone, whoever calls, you're gonna, then you will be wasting your time. But this comes from being in the associations that they are. But honestly, I mean, it comes from what one will call the grind, but cold calling and cold outreach, man. That's, it's really, if you're dialing that phone, and you're sending emails that are informative or just asking for the business to get some time with them to just have a conversation. It's that cold outreach that gets to them because they're inundated with stuff. But if you can get them on the phone for a minute and kind of tell them your story and just say you're looking for a conversation, that's how you get the, the larger ones and staying on their radar because that sales cycle is, if you're lucky, one year. But it's usually two, three, four. Because once you get on their radar and you become next best friend, then you can start developing that relationship on the larger one. There's more relationship. And then, you know, everybody wants that big guy. Everybody wants that big guy, you know, that big shiny. Yes. If I just get this account, then that'll put me at my, at my goal for the year. But everybody's calling on that because it's, it's just what it is. And 
the next thing I think is, do you have, like you said, like if you're going after the top, top, like the tippity top, right? That might be a little more challenging. Have you found sort of a sweet spot as to where like, you know, they're not quite yeah. the bottom of the so, threshold, but they're not, you know, but they're going to, they're going to get the job done. And I'm still, you know, setting up processes on how to be the most efficient. We use Salesforce. So you have tasks to kind of keep up, but like on the large, large one, like those elephants, you want to get a little creative. You have like, we call it creative drops, right? You know, you do something kind of gimmicky, but maybe not send it to them to get their attention, right? And you can have that elephant list that you can be more, what word am I looking, unique with, right? You can specialize to them because, you know, if you get one of those, that's a good one. So you can kind of do the slow drip with them and really know them well and approach it from a different angle. Whereas these, what you're looking at is that sweet spot. Um, I'm finding is there's Marsh, right? Who's number one. And then the next three, four combined are as big as them. And they've written a lot of stuff in the past. And I'm finding that uh, once you get to that mid to large market, if you've been there a while, then they go up, right? And so these nice, sweet, I guess we can talk premium just to keep the normies in here. But, you know, 75 to 200 grand in premium or 100 to 200 that's kind of 250 those are the people that have maybe been on these books for five to ten years and as that person that producer that agency's grown they've kind of gotten the oh okay a little less attention and and that's a good number right and if you give them the attention that they probably once received or they're just they've grown and been part of a small agency then you can provide resources to help them out, right? It's harder to find the guys with the mom and pops that just aren't as sophisticated as you are because everybody's getting bought up. That's the thing. You used to be able to go, oh, they're with so-and-so agency or, or like a state farm, right? Like, and, that, and that's just a pop getting pumped out. You can provide resources and, and really start helping them grow their business even more. That helps, but now you go after those guys and they're with the marsh and they've seen all that stuff. So you got to be a little bit more unique and, and give them the attention. Right. Well, I, I promise that I have to deliver on the promise. So I want to go back to, like you said, your the, the sort of the secret of standing out in the stack, uh, the checking of the box. Uh, like, what's the thing that you find really sets you apart? Like what's, what's, what's one thing that's going to get the attention and going to get the grease the wheels on that? On that um, simple thing is having everything that you know that they want on that submission just everything in one email that is going to give them the ammo because these underwriters like i said they're box checking you have to provide these newer underwriters that don't have the autonomy the ammo if you're getting some trying to get something tricky in there you have to give them the ammo to run it up the ladder because if you give them that then they feel comfortable going up and saying hey this may have a little hair on it but look at x y and z that they pointed out and it's all there. And these enterprises are so busy because the market's hard. So they're just getting inundated with submissions. So if it's not in one email and everything they need next, you know, they don't want to sit there just like you don't, you don't want five emails. You want one email and you can answer it done. They, if they, they're like, Oh, okay. Now I have to send, here's your submission. Now I have to send 20 questions back to you. They don't want to do that. They're so busy. They can pick and choose these nice accounts that they want. Everything's being marketed. So they, they've got the pick of the litter. And um, if so, to your point, hey, knowing what you're going for. So if you commercial real estate, you know what they're asking. You've got the right supplemental for that, you know, multifamily risk. You've got what are the pains of that industry? You address how they are a risk manager, not just someone looking for a piece of paper that says they have insurance, right? You know, they've got the right safety controls in. They've got, you know, people that do safety meetings for X, Y, and Z. Um, you provide those loss runs. That seems to be the thing. Not just saying loss runs, you can do an analysis on the loss runs, which we're trying to do now. You know, they're trying to mess with deductibles. So you do a history of the losses, what they've paid, and if you put you know, deductible here, you're actually this much more profitable. So you're trying to reframe everything because these underwriters have the AI now to just spout out numbers. So if you're not combating that with your own, which we have, you know, analytics here, 
and giving them the reasons to say yes, it seems like they are looking for all the reasons to say no first, right? So if you're not giving them the yes answers up front, it's you're just firing it off into the ether and you're sitting there with your fingers crossed. All right, Ryan, I've got three more questions for you. Ooh. And the first one is, what's one thing you hope you never forget? I cheated and I did listen to your podcast. And my first three answers were definitely nothing to do with insurance, but I know that's not the case. So I would say, I don't want to forget that it always works out. If you're doing what you're supposed to do and you're doing it to the best abilities, it always works out. Sometimes not the way you'd like it or not the way you planned, but it does uh, just kind of give an example as with this market being hard, non-renewals coming out, you know, you can get into a real frenzy panicking about, oh, am I going to be able to find it? But I've never not been able to find some insurance. It's not maybe sometimes the best, but you can get caught up real quick, just panicking every day, worried, you know, two months out, what am I going to do with this account? But if you're doing what you're supposed to be doing and you're informing the clients and keeping them updated, it, it always works out, if, you know? So I don't want to forget that it always works out. All right, Ryan, there are no rules here, so feel free to take these in any direction you want. But uh, on the other side of that, what's one thing you still have yet to learn? When to ask for help, man. <laughs> I guess I I learned that I stink at it, but more like delegation. That's one thing, you know, you can't do it all, especially at this level, because my background, I've done it all, right? I've done account management, marketing. So I have the skill set to do it all. And when sometimes it gets down to the wire, you want to do that. But my number one job is to sell. I actually heard a good, a good quote because I'll try and help out service team or, you know, I try and keep a great relationship with people here and my service team, especially, right. You know, they, the other ones that make the magic happen in the background, Weinstein talking about his mentor. And he said, your job isn't to care about the service team. Your job is to bury the bastards. <laughs> And I was like, oh, man, you know, because it does work out. But, yeah, once you start thinking outside of sales and not bringing it in, you know, that's that's our job. That's our job to do. So one thing you have to learn how to delegate properly and and, and trust that they're going to do the job. Right. That's one thing and I do trust. Them, but especially, on the, you know, putting that top of stack submission together. Like, I know how to do this as opposed to saying, hey, this is how I would do it. Take this as please and then let them run with it sometimes there's i know the markets and you know when you know something you want to do it your way just maybe the stubbornness but yeah when to ask for help and when to let people just stay in your lane all right ryan last question to you sir if i were to hand you a magic wand of sorts to reshape change alter speed up really any part of insurance what's that thing where is it going and what's it doing i like how you say speed it up I, i'm like the opposite i want to slow it down i'd say slow it down you know the emails flying in and everybody expects you to answer an email within 45 minutes and the technology has sped things up in a good way in a bad way right you're i mean my phone i don't have a work phone in here there's not even a phone in here this, this is this so it's text message it's it's constant so i would say slowing it down really and just giving people a realistic expectation but to your point, another thing to quote, speed things up is, is kind of changing the perception of the industry, right? As I mentioned, the underwriters that were, had autonomy and, and could get creative are retiring and not just underwriters, right? People, the agents are getting older and they're retiring. And there's not a lot of younger, I would say I'm, I do see more coming in on the sales side, but on that back end side, because those people bring in the processes to speed things up on the back end, right? So they know how to use the technology to their advantage to someone that may be doing some data entry the old school way and saving it in a file on the desktop and, and then maybe not recreate that process. The, the younger generation is more savvy and they can bring in just simple little things, you know, on Excel doing a pivot table or something, you know, that's, don't get me started in Excel, but those skills that they have to bring in and speed up the industry. So changing the perception of it for the younger people to 
think it's not just boring insurance, really. I mean, it's it's a good business. Everybody needs it. And you learn a lot, man. You know, I say insurance is the more you know, the less you know in this business because there is so much. It really works your brain. I'm not, I don't have a college degree. I've been doing this a long time. It's hard to keep up with those high IQ brains doing this stuff, right? I'm, I'm a dummy, man. I'm an EQ brain. So when you get, I just say, yeah, getting a, maybe getting a different perception to have them come in and speed things up on that. Ryan, this has been fantastic, sir. I'm going to leave it right there. My man, it's always a pleasure.